Welcome, my name is Deborah Walker, and I'm speaking to you from Revival from Down Under, which is a Christian church located in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne, Australia. So I'd like to welcome all those joining us tonight and those watching online. Delighted to have you with you, with us, praise God. And we're delighted to be with you. So thank you for allowing us into your place tonight. And so praise God. We just want God to have his way in each of our hearts and each of our lives in every nation. And it's all about his glory. And today I'd like to speak on a topic that I've called hearing and obeying God's voice. Hearing and obeying God's voice. And scripture reveals that God is three. So I'm opening my King James Bible to 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7. And we read here, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. So God is God, the Father, God, the Word and God, the Holy Ghost. They are three distinct beings, yet one in unity and purpose. And we know that God, the Word became Jesus and of course, Jesus spoke to people. Let's turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And we read here, starting in verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehends it not and verse 5 in the amplified says and light shines on in the darkness for the darkness has never overpowered it put it out or absorbed it or appropriated it and is unreceptive to it and verse 14 it says and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth hallelujah so this topic is hearing and obeying god's voice so regarding hearing allow me to ask you a question what do you believe hearing god's voice is what do you believe hearing god's voice is and you may think that Hearing God's voice is actually hearing a voice verbally spoken by God. And for some, that is true. In scripture, we read of some who've literally heard God the Father's voice. For example, at Jesus' water baptism, John the Baptist heard God's voice. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 3 and verse 17. And it says here, Matthew 3, 17, And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Praise God. And when Jesus took Peter, James and John up to the Mount of Transfiguration, we read also in Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. And in verse, starting in verse 2. And it says here, And after six days, Jesus takes with him Peter, James and John and leads them up into the high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow. So no fuller on earth can white them. And there appeared unto them Elijah and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And it was not what to say, for they were sore afraid. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. All right, so John the Baptist heard that audible voice and Peter, James and John heard that audible voice. And let's turn over to Second Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. And of course, Peter's writing this. And 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. 
and we read here, and it says here, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honour and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And I'll just read it from the Amplified, verse 16. For we were not following cleverly devised stories when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, grandeur, authority of sovereign power. For when he, when he was invested with honour and glory from God the Father and a voice was born to him by the splendid majesty, the glory, he glory in the bright cloud that overshadowed him saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased and delight. And we actually heard this voice born out of heaven for we were together with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word made firmer still. You will do well to pay close attention to it as a lamp shining in a dismal, squalid and dark place until the day breaks through the gloom and the morning star rises, comes into being in your hearts. Yet first you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of any personal or private or special interpretation, loosening and solving. For no prophecy ever originated because some man willed it to do so. It never came by human impulse, but men spoke from God who were born along, moved and impelled by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we, we know that all scripture was inspired by the word of God. We know that it was all scripture was inspired by God. Hallelujah. It was not just men writing down whatever they wanted. It was the Lord inspiring them what to write. Meanwhile, over the years, I've heard a number of reports about people who thought it was God speaking to them when really it was the devil speaking to them and instructing them to do terrible crimes. You may have heard the similar stories. People literally thought they heard God telling them to do these dreadful crimes. And the devil, we know he's a liar and he's a deceiver. And unfortunately, these people were not able to discern that it was the devil speaking to them and egging them on to do these manner of these dreadful things. So question, how is it that a person can be hearing and yet not really hearing? Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we read here in verse 14. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And the Amplified says, verse 14, But the natural, non-spiritual man does not accept or welcome or admit into his heart the gifts and teachings and revelations of the Spirit of God, for they are folly, meaningless nonsense to him. And he is incapable of knowing them, of progressively recognizing, understanding and becoming better acquainted with them because they are spiritually discerned, estimated and appreciated. The Bible is a spiritual book. We know it's got natural words written in it, but it's a spiritual book. And we need, it's the spirit of God that leads and guides us into all truth. It's God who gives us understanding of his words. And that's why, because the natural man cannot receive spiritual things, that's why we need to be born again, being born of God. Because, and how did that happen? Because we believed on God's son, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And so as believers, we're now able to hear God, not with our natural ears, but more importantly, with our spiritual ears 
in our heart. All right. Not our natural ears, our spiritual ears, which are in our heart. And also, may I say that as as or after we're born again and as we grow spiritually and as a believer filled with the Holy Spirit, you will be able to discern, recognize the voice of God, the Holy Spirit. The voice of the Holy Spirit, it's not a loud, booming voice. It's a still, small voice. And when you hear the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit, there is no hesitation. You know that you know it's the voice of the Holy Spirit. But as I said earlier, some people do not have spiritual discernment. Meanwhile, although some Christians may think they literally need to hear God's voice, a booming voice, we need to understand that God's word is what he has said. And what he has said is his voice. The Bible is God's voice to us today. So what are we as Christians to do? What can, be, what can we be certain of? If there's many voices, voices, sometimes it's your own, it's your own th voices, you know, your own thoughts, your own inner being thoughts, or it's the devil's thoughts, or it could be the Holy Spirit. You know, you, we need that discernment. But, you know, the most important thing is God has given us his word, the Bible. And the Bible is God's voice. It is God's word given to men to write down. I'll say that again. It's God's word given to men to write down. And so we have a record, black and white in print, we have a record of God's will. It includes events that have taken place and events that are still to take place before Jesus returns. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And, you know, many times in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, Jesus said, they who have ears that hear, let them hear. And again, the ears we hear God's word with are not our natural ears, but our spiritual ears. All right. And, you know, Jesus spoke many parables. And what's a parable? A parable is the use of natural things to hide spiritual truth from those who don't have spiritual ears to hear. And, you know, even Jesus' disciples did not always hear him until he opened their ears. And a good example of Jesus opening the ears of his disciples is shown in Matthew 13 with the parable of the sower and the seed. After speaking the parable, Jesus said in verse 9, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And then in verse 10 it says, And the disciples came to him and said, under him, why speakest thou in parables? All right, let's turn to it. It's in Matthew 13. We're just going to read a little bit here. Matthew 13. You know, he told the parable. The disciples didn't understand it. And, uh, and then they even asked him, well, why are you talking to people in parables? And then Jesus gives the explanation. Matthew 13, verse 11. And we read here. And he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but unto them it is not given. So who's the you? It's the disciples are given understanding of the parables. For whosoever has to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever has not from him shall be taken away, even that which he has. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Elias, which says, by hearing you shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their hearts and should be converted, and I shall heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Verse 17. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear, and have not heard them. Hear you therefore the parable of the sower. Right, we need to have ears to hear. 
spiritual ears to hear what God is saying through his word. And many renowned people of old would have loved to have been in the time of Jesus. And I tell you, they would either have loved to be in the time we are now when the fulfillment of many scriptures is coming to pass in our lifetime. And, you know, when Jesus first spoke this parable, his disciples did not hear. They didn't really understand what he was saying. They didn't understand. They knew what he was saying naturally, but they didn't understand it spiritually. And then so Jesus gave them understanding. And that is a real key. If we don't understand scripture, we can ask God to show us. That's what the disciples did. They said to Jesus, please give us understanding. Well, we can go to God and say, can you please give me understanding of your word? I want to understand your word. And if we cry after knowledge and understanding of God's word, he will give us understanding of God's word. Hallelujah. And if we just read on in verse, uh, verse 24, Jesus put forth another parable unto them and a man which sowed good seed in his field. Verse 25, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when, when the blade was sprung up and brought forth, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in the field? From whence has these the tares? And he said unto them, An enemy has done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then we should go and gather them up? But he said, No. Lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather you together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barns. Into my barn. Uh, tares, when they're young, look just like wheat. They're actually a weed, but they have a real similar visual appearance to wheat but as the wheat grows and the tares grow then you really see a, a very distinct difference but God said Jesus said just let them grow until the end of the world to the end of the harvest and verse 36 Jesus goes on to say then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into his house and the disciples came unto him saying declare unto this the parable of the tares in the field so there they are again they go to Jesus Lord Jesus what are you saying here what do you really mean here in other words, the disciples, you know, they so desired to understand spiritually what Jesus was saying. So Jesus opened their ears so they could understand what he was saying. Verse 37 says here, And he answered and said unto them, He that sows the good seed is the son of man. Well, we know from the parable of sowing the seed that the seed is the word of God. So the son of man, Jesus, is sowing the word of God. And verse 38, the field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The son of man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father who has ears to hear, let him hear. You know, do we have ears to hear? We are in the end times and there are two kingdoms. There's the kingdom, God's kingdom, and there's the devil kingdom. And we need to make sure we remain in the kingdom of God. All right. So, and we, and to, re, to help us stay in the kingdom of God, we're going to have, have ears that hear. And we will know the time we're in. We will know the season we were in. God will help us with understanding his word. So if we have hearts that hear his word, Amen. And the other part of this topic is about being obedient. And so what about obedience? And um, we read in, of he, Jesus in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7 to 9. It says here, 
Then said I, lo, speaking of Jesus, then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He takes away the first, being the law, that he may establish the second. That's the new covenant. All right. Speaking of Jesus, he said, I've come to do thy will, O God. Jesus came to obey the will of his father. And Jesus gives us the example and he says, follow me. All right. So God wants us to obey the will of the father. And what's his will? The word of God. And Jesus said many times he'd come to do his father's will. Hallelujah. And, you know, for us, when we read in the Bible, there's many places where it says God requires obedience to his word and he still does today. And there's a principle in the word of God of first the natural and second the spiritual. Therefore, natural Israel in the Old Testament there who came first is an example to spiritual Israel, God's church. And we are to learn from natural Israel what they experienced, what they went through, uh, do the good things that they did and not do the bad things. All right. We are to learn. They are an example to us. Let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 36. Jeremiah 36. And we're just starting here in verse 1. And it says here, And it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the king of the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take thee a roll, which is a scroll, take thee a roll of a book, and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel. Well, who's it against? Israel, natural Israel. And against Judah and against all the nations, from the day I spake unto thee, from the days of Josiah, even unto this day. Verse 3. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I purpose to do to them, that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. Then Jeremiah called Barak the son of Neriah, and Barak wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord, which he had spoken unto him upon a roll of a book. And Jeremiah commanded Barak saying, I am shut up. He wasn't able to do it himself. He said, I cannot go into the house of the Lord. Verse six, therefore go thou and read the roll which thou has written from my mouth, the words of the Lord in the ears of the people in the Lord's house upon the fasting day. And also thou shalt read them in the ears of all Judah that come out of their cities. It may be that they will present their supplication before the Lord and will return every one from his evil way. For great is the anger and the fury that the Lord has pronounced unto this people. And Barak, the son of Neriah, did according to all that Jeremiah the prophet commanded him, reading in the book the words of the Lord in the Lord's house. Hallelujah. Well, today I'm actually reading the words of the Lord. In God's house, we as believers, we are all part of God's house and God's word has been given to us to keep us in the narrow way. And it gives us a warning. It gives us a warning what consequences are of disobedience. And so we want to be an obedient people, don't we? It's doing and being all that God would have us to be and walking in ways that please him. Hallelujah. And if we just look over into Hebrews, just to clarify this a bit more, Hebrews chapter 3, and it says here, verse 6, But Christ is a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. So there we are. We are the house of God, and God's word is coming to his house. Verse 7, and I was just thinking then, you know, and God's not going to judge the world because he said first judgment's going to come to the house of God. So we are hearing God's word and God's just bringing adjustment to all of our lives. And uh, praise God, we need him to adjust us. Hallelujah. To make us more like him. 
and verse 7 it says wherefore as the holy ghost says today today if you'll hear his voice harden not your hearts as in the provocation the day of temptation in the wilderness when your fathers tempted me proved me and saw my works 40 years whereof I was grieved with that generation and said they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Natural Israel, they hardened their heart. They went through the testings. They went through the wilderness. And instead of those situations drawing them to God, they actually hardened their heart and drew back and, and fell into unbelief. And, you know, God doesn't want that. And uh, all roads lead to the heart. And God looks on the heart. And, you know, God gave natural Israel commandments, instructions, and they chose to disobey obedience is a choice everybody has freedom of choice god doesn't force us he just puts it out there choose you this day life or death blessing or cursing choose you this day and you know god wants us to make good choices and if we don't unfortunately there will be consequences but god wants us to uh, obey his word and for us god desires us to hear and obey what he is saying through his word. If we turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2, it says here, For he says, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. The day of salvation is always now. It's always today. And if we hear God's word, God's voice, we shall live. And whoever is hearing or reading God's word today, God is speaking to that person in real time. Like God's word is now to those who believe. Now is the time of salvation. Now is the day. Now is the time. And as believers, you know, to receive salvation, you know, you heard God speaking to your heart. You may not have heard an audible voice, but it was just as real for you. You heard God's word speaking to your heart and convicting you of sin. And you realized your need for salvation. And so you obeyed. You responded from your heart, confessed with your mouth, and you were saved. Hallelujah. And, you know, regarding God's uh, obedience to God's voice, God's word says that natural Israel, he was always trying to speak to natural Israel. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus 19. And we read here in verse 5 and 6. Now, this is the Lord speaking to natural Israel. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar, that means a special treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak unto the children of Israel. So God actually spoke to Moses and then Moses relayed it onto the people. All right. And you know what God was saying, you know, you will be a, a, a special nation. You're going to be a kingdom of priests. That was his, that was God's plan. And yet they must not have heard or obeyed what God said, because what God said didn't happen to natural Israel. He wanted the whole, all of them to be the priesthood. But they weren't. We know he ended up choosing just one tribe. But did you hear what God said? God hasn't changed his plan. God is still going to have a kingdom of priests. That's on his heart. And those who hear and obey will attain to what God requires of them. Hallelujah. God's got the plan. And let's turn over to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. 
and verse 5 it says here, And you also as lively or living stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. It said that you, you, me, we're to be a holy priesthood. And verse 9, it says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. That's a king priesthood. A holy nation, a peculiar, that special people. It's just like we read in Exodus, in Exodus 19. That you should show forth the praise of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So having a royal priesthood, a holy nation of priests is still God's desire today for those who hear his voice and obey it. He has not changed his mind. He is going to have a nation of priests, royal priests. Hallelujah. Let's turn over to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 6. And we read here, Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power, but they shall be as priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The first resurrection. Scripture shows there are two resurrections. One of the just, which is the godly, and one of the unjust, the ungodly. And we see this in Acts chapter 24. Acts 24 and verse 15. It says here, And have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. And let's turn over to John chapter 5. And we're just going to read what Jesus said. John 5, verse 29, and it says here, and this is what Jesus said, And shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So here's Jesus talking about two resurrections. The resurrection of life is the first resurrection. And if we just go back to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4, we read here, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Scripture shows that the mark of the beast is issued during the great tribulation period. And we see in this scripture, in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, that those who lit will, there will be some who will literally lose their heads in the great tribulation. But as Christians, they will be part of the first resurrection. And these Christians are the ones that find themselves in the great tribulation. And for some, that's news. Not everybody is going to miss out on the tribulation. There are going to be some Christians, unfortunately, the foolish virgins who are going to find themselves in the period of the great tribulation. And because they refuse to take the mark, they realize they've missed the bride, they've missed, they've missed that being taken away out of it all. They'll find themselves in the great tribulation. And because they re then they will refuse to take the mark, they're going to be killed by the two beasts of Revelation 13. And that occurs during the time of the last 42 months prior to Jesus' return. And the Great Tribulation goes for 42 months. That's the time that the two beasts have power over the earth. And so during the Great Tribulation period, they will be the ones that will not receive the mark of the beast or worship his image. And unfortunately, they will be killed. But at their death, they pass into eternity. All right. Praise God. And let's turn to back to John, back to Jesus, what he said, John chapter 5. And verse 25, it says here. And this is what Jesus said. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is 
when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Who are the dead that will live? Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, And you has he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. The Amplified says, And you he made alive when you were dead, slain by your trespasses and sins. It's a spiritual condition. We were dead spiritually and now we've made alive. Also verses 5 and 6. Even when we were dead in our sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved and has raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And of course, we understand that life and death is a natural condition. However, and more importantly, life or death is a spiritual condition. And we'll just read verses five and six in the Amplified. It says, even when we were dead, slain by our own shortcomings and trespasses, he made us alive together in fellowship and in union with Christ. He gave us the very life of Christ himself, the same new life with which he quickened him. For it is by grace, his favour and mercy, which you did not deserve, that you are saved, delivered from judgment and made partakers of Christ's salvation. And he raised us up together with him and made us sit down together giving us joint seating with him in the heavenly sphere by virtue of our being in Christ Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When did we get spiritually raised up to be seated in heavenly places? When we received Jesus as our savior, when we were born again, we changed from spiritual death to spiritual life and we are seated spiritually. Our feet might be on the ground on earth, but spiritually, we are seated beside Jesus in heavenly places. Hallelujah. And let's turn to John chapter 11. John 11. And verse 25. And Jesus said, now we know that Lazarus had died. This is the setting. But Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. All right. Now, we know the situation was about Lazarus. He actually literally had died. But what Jesus is actually saying, when we receive salvation, we immediately pass from spiritual death into spiritual life. Amen. We become alive spiritually. Amen. And then in verse 26, we read what Jesus said. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Believest thou this, right? Whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Believest thou this. When we believe in Jesus Christ, we just stay with him. We will never die. Our spirit will can stay alive through to eternity. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so are you hearing what God is saying? We were dead in trespasses and sin, but now we are alive in Christ. Hallelujah. And we can go all the way through to eternity alive. Hallelujah. And if you took your last breath today as a believer who's up to date with God, although, of course, your body would decompose, but your spirit is eternal. You, you are an eternal being. You live in a body, but you are an eternal being. And you, if you're up to date with the Lord, you will be alive in the presence of God for eternity. Hallelujah. Praise God. That's the power of the resurrection. We have been resurrected from dead and brought into life. And, you know, and we also do know, of course, there are literally people who have physically died and come back to life. You know, they've put the jumpers on them or whatever, the pads or, and they've experienced a death experience and come back to life. But that's just a minority. That's a few people. But what Jesus is offering, he's offering everybody eternal life, eternal life, not just for a few little, just a few people that experience natural death. He's talking about 
the multitude, everybody, it's a whosoever believes, can have eternal life if they will turn from their sins and turn to God, confess their sin and uh, turn away from sin, turning to God and walking in God's ways, receiving God's forgiveness and walk with God every day. It's amazing. And this is what God wants to do with every person on the planet if they will just turn to him. Hallelujah. And, you know, now we're going to, I'm just going to read some scriptures. And if we can hear these, what God desires to do in your life and mine. Let's turn over to Deuteronomy. But do we hear it? We've got to hear it. 28. We've got to hear it in our heart because this is what God wants to do. Why? Because he's the same yesterday, today and forever. God has not changed. What he promised to natural Israel, he is still promising to those in his church today. Deuteronomy 28 verse 1 to 7, it says here, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken, that's listen here, diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations. And all these blessings shall come upon thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Verse 3, Blessed thou shalt be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, and the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall thou be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shall be thou when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies which rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses and in all that thou settest thy hand unto. And he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Verse 9. And the Lord shall establish thee a holy people unto himself. Here we are. It's a holy people. God still wants a holy people unto himself as it is sworn unto thee. If thou shalt keep the commandment of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways and all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord and they shall be afraid of thee. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, in the fruit of thy body, in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy ground, and in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers to give thee. The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain in the land in his season, and to bless all the work of thy hand. And thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow." The Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail, and thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath, if thou hearkenest unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's absolutely wonderful blessings when we hear God's word and obey it. God's blessings will chase us down. That's what he's saying. If we will just hear and obey. Hallelujah. And let's turn over to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. And the foundation of everything in our walk with God, it says in verse 11, verse 6, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You know, a natural reward is given to a person for achieving or accomplishing something. It's a recompense of service or merit. It's a recompense. It's a reward. Well, God is the rewarder and he sees all that is accomplished by faith for his glory. Amen. Let's read it from the Amplified, verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. But and he sat and be satisfactory to him. For whoever would come near to God must necessarily believe that God exists and that he is the rewarder of those who earnestly and diligently seek him out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We've got to stay in. We've got to keep at it. We just keep pressing in. 
believing, not getting into a work situation. You know, I must do this and, oh, you know, and putting ourselves under the law. It's a faith believing that God is with us. God is for us. God's leading and guiding and God's blessings are chasing us down. It's a growing in him and it's all about faith. It's faith towards God and God wants to confirm his word in each of our lives. And if we turn over to Romans chapter 10, where does faith come from? Romans 10 verse 17 and it says here, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So it's hearing, we're back to hearing again. And it's not with our natural ears, although it's good of course to hear the word of God, but it's hearing with our spiritual ears. Because when we hear with our spiritual ears, we go, it just goes, the light comes on in our heart. We just get it. We, it's like, boom, we just get it. It's just, well, that's, a, that's the expression. The light goes on. I get it. I see it. And that's the faith. When it rises up, faith's a powerful force. And so faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of God. It doesn't come through circumstances or situations. Faith comes from the word of God. And it, the word of God ignites faith in our heart. And if we turn over to John chapter 10, John chapter 10, and we know that Jesus is the good shepherd. And John chapter 10, verse 11, it says here, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. So he's the good shepherd and we are his sheep. And verse three, it says, to him the porter openeth and the sheep hear his voice and he calleth his own sheep by name and leads them out. Verse 16, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring and they shall hear my voice. The other sheep, not of that fold, are going to hear my voice, Jesus' voice, and, they shall be, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. The other sheep that Jesus is speaking about, because Jesus came to speak to the Jews, the other sheep that Jesus is talking about is the Gentiles nations. It's the non-Jews. It's us. Hallelujah. We are to hear his voice. And then verse 27, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Hallelujah. We, we, wanna, we are hearing his voice. He knows us and we're following him. Hallelujah. With his help. And so true sheep hear the word. And how do you know or recognize true sheep? They are hungry for and obedient to God's word. Hungry after God's word. And then Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And we're talking about hearing again. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. It says here, Therefore, whoso hears these sayings of mine and doeth them or does them, I will liken him unto a wise man who built his house upon a rock and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon the house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that hears these sayings of mine and does them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. The rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. What was the difference between the wise man and the foolish man? The wise man heard God's word and did it. And the foolish man heard God's word and didn't do it. And, you know, from that, you know, that means to hear God's word, you're in church. And so there are foolish, there are people in church that are hearing the word of God and not obeying it. And that scripture calls them foolish. God wants us to hear his word and apply it, do it, live it. Amen. And then we just read down in Revelation chapter 3, what Jesus says. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 22. 20 to 22, it says here, this is Jesus saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, that's the door of our heart, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, 
even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So are you hearing and are you obeying what you have heard? Am I hearing and am I obeying the word of God? It's for all of us. And finally, let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 7. And we read here, again, he limiteth a certain day saying to David, today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. You know, our hearts harden when we choose not to hear and not to obey God's word. And so in summary, with God's help, May we have soft hearts that hear and obey God's word for his glory. And everyone said, Amen.